How doing? Well. Hmm? Any uh, questions, comments, concerns, etc. before we get started? Students already just asked me a few silly things, but they were part of the job. What did you do this weekend? This weekend, I worked on a novel I've been writing. I grilled, I think Saturday. Slept mostly, if I'm being honest. What's your novel I play a lot of D and D, meaning I've got a lot of characters that have racked up over the years. And sometimes when I don't get to play them, I just make my own stories. And now I'm trying to—I've done enough of that to where I'm just trying to turn it into its own self-contained story. That takes a lot of free time. Indeed, and that's why I haven't actually had you know, had the time to touch it in a while. Yeah. I don't think I've meaningfully worked on it since before summer started. Ironically, normal D&D takes up more of my time because I always have to have something planned for when my brother comes over to play, brother-in-law. Please do interrupt me with any questions or concerns as they pop up. For class today, last week we began chapter six, uh, talking about momentum, uh, which is defined as a measurement of how difficult something is to stop. If it has a lot of momentum, if an object has a lot of momentum, it is very hard to stop because it either has a lot of mass, is moving very quickly, or both. If something has no momentum, it's very easy to stop because it's probably already stopped. Um, the only other way that something can have no momentum is if it has no mass. And the only thing that really has no mass is light. So no matter how fast light is, it has no momentum. Kind of weird. The fastest thing in the universe has no momentum. We're going to be primarily examining momentum uh, by looking at collisions. Uh, that being an interaction where two objects collide and uh, exert force on each other, have an exchange of momentum and kinetic energy. Uh, we discussed on Friday how momentum is conserved in a collision, like how energy is conserved from the before to after of any sort of an action. I ended last time by pointing out that momentum is always conserved in an interaction. One, because momentum has no form it can take other than momentum. Um, if you're looking at the energy of some sort of a interaction, it might more commonly look like the energy isn't conserved because the energy can turn into forms that are harder to track. Very famously, kinetic energy can turn directly into heat because of friction, and that makes it hard to see where all the energy went a lot of the time. Uh, but momentum has no other form it can take. It's always momentum. It can't turn into something that, it can't turn into a non-mechanical form like how energy can turn into heat. Yes? Conserved akin to energy. Um, is that saying that it, the way it's conserved is separately from energies? Similar to energy. Oh, similar. It is conserved like how energy is conserved. Notice here, yeah. total momentum initial, total momentum final, same as total energy initial equals total So moment, energy is conserved from start to finish. It's just sometimes hard to notice because it turns into lots of different forms and you have to consider all of them. But momentum only has the one form. Even then, there are still cases where it doesn't always look like momentum is conserved. I've mentioned noise incoming. I hit my own foot just there, whoops. Uh, I mentioned a case where you know, if one object collides with a really big object, it might look like the moment, like the wall just didn't gain any momentum there. It might appear as though the momentum that went into the wall just vanished. 
but it didn't. It's just that the wall is so massive you don't see it moving, and the momentum it absorbs is dispersed throughout the entire building. That's not the only case where the momentum might not look like it's conserved or is weirdly conserved, and we're going to look at a different case of that today, namely the case of explosions. Because explosions, weirdly, are just a type of collision, technically speaking. To demonstrate that, we're going to be doing a question involving a cannon today. But for further context, I'm going to mention a different example first. So this is the version, this is the thing we're going to put numbers to, but I want to give a different conceptual example in addition to that. I've at this point, I may as well be contractually obligated to mention Mythbusters about once a day. One of my favorite episodes was the water heater rocket episode, where they took a water heater, disabled all of its safety features, and just let it boil until it literally blows up. The steam inside just pressurizes until the physical metal can't bear it, and it just explodes. Sometimes it takes off into the sky, but it could also just go, it could pop. Before that happens, though, what is the momentum of the water heater just sitting here? Zero. It's not moving yet. But if it does explode, going to shatter into a bunch of different pieces that are all going to take off in a bunch of different directions. Do the individual pieces have momentum now? No. Now they do. They gained momentum from the blast. But what is the total momentum after the blast? After the blast? Mm -hmm. Once all this happened and once all the pieces are rocketing off in different directions, what does all the total momentum of each piece add up to? Still zero. The law of conservation of momentum tells us it must, because if the initial total was zero, the final total would also be zero. But how can the final total be zero if every single piece has different momentum? Is it because they're going in different directions? Yep. Right. So Momentum's a vector, meaning that up and down cancel out and left and right cancel out. So each individual piece has a non-zero momentum, but the momentum of each piece still adds back together to zero. That is true of things that shatter in lots of different directions, but to simplify that, we're going to look at a case with only two directions, forward and backward, in the case of this cannon. So, this is the more complicated version. We're going to look at this, where we just have one thing rocketing forwards, the cannonball in this case, and the cannon recoiling backwards. And we're going to demonstrate that this still works, that it's going to be 0 equals 0 in this scenario. You OK for an objective right now? All right. Before we actually get to that, there's another vocab word I have to give you. It's not a new concept, technically. It's just a vocab word. And that is the term impulse. We know that the momentum of an object can change. In the example we did on Friday with the arrow hitting the log, the arrow lost momentum and then the log gained the same amount. So the momentum level of each object changed. And that's going to be true here in a second as well. Initially, the cannon itself and the cannonball loaded into it have no momentum. After the explosion, they will both have some amount of momentum in different directions. The momentum level of each item changed. And physicists decided that that concept, the change in momentum, needed its own vocab word. And the vocab word they gave it was impulse. Yes. That's, that's a row, right? That's a row, yes. Okay. Sorry. I forgot to update the font on this slide. 
Yes, this says change in momentum. This is supposed to be delta rho. I apologize. Delta rho is impulse. The definition of impulse is just the change in momentum. It's just a specific vocab word for that concept. But they didn't just stop at giving it a vocab word. They decided to give it its own letter. I am used to using lowercase j. Sometimes in my brain I call it gym pulse to remember that. You got gym pulse and row momentum. So impulse is the lowercase j. Yes. Force is the voice Time. Force times time. Force times time. And that is because whenever something's momentum changes, it's because a force caused it to accelerate. When the arrow hits the log, the log exerts a force on the arrow, causing the arrow to accelerate, changing its velocity, doing work on it to take its energy and momentum away. Likewise, the arrow exerts a force on the log, pushing the log forward slightly, doing work on it to give it momentum and kinetic energy. And that force, like it's the same force forwards and backwards on each object, because Newton's third law says that if one acts on the other, the other acts back on the first. So two objects in a collision always exert the same force on each other. Even if it doesn't look like the forces involved are symmetrical, if a truck runs into a mosquito on the highway, the mosquito exerts the same force on the truck that the truck exerts on the mosquito. It's just that one Newton is enough to obliterate a mosquito and it's not enough to phase the truck. But it's the same force. And namely, that same force acts for the same amount of time on both objects, that force over time causing the objects to accelerate. So we're kind of actually bringing Newton's second law into this. Force causes masses to accelerate. So the force involved in a collision, be it a normal collision or be it a, a blast going off, the force involved causes acceleration. Acceleration causes velocity to change over time. Therefore, force causes impulse. And that's where this new formula comes from. Uh, however, I've only just realized today that not only did I not edit the font on this slide, I didn't edit it on the formula sheet either. Because um, the formula sheet seems to commonly use uppercase P for momentum when it's not supposed to. And it also uses uppercase I for impulse, which is also technically wrong. So my apologies. The P's in both momentum, conservation of momentum, and the impulse formula are supposed to be lowercase rows, and the I in impulse is supposed to be a J. That's so the I does make more sense. I'm not going to fault you if you leave it that way. Trouble is that I also stands for something else, which doesn't start with I, weirdly. England physics ran out of letters a long time ago. Surprised we don't steal more Greek letters. Surprised we don't steal from more alphabets. We certainly need the real estate. Anyway, back to the actual concept at hand. Impulse just means change in momentum. Change in momentum happens because the objects involved in a collision or an explosion exert force on each other for a certain amount of time that causes them to accelerate. And as a result, the velocities will change for each mass. And so, that's another thing I forgot to edit this morning. This is my full four-part version for a definition for impulse. I prefer adding the mass times change in velocity because usually when something is undergoing an impulse, very noticeably its velocity is changing. So mass times change in velocity tells you change in momentum, which is impulse. And interesting historical fact, Newton actually, I believe, did more work with 
momentum and impulse than what than people realize to the point where this is the version of Newton's second law that the guy actually wrote down. He didn't write F equals MA, he wrote this. It just happens to be that F equals MA is the same as this. Because change in momentum can be written as mass times change in velocity. So mass times change in velocity over time, change in velocity over time is acceleration. So it's all connected. But Interesting historical footnote. This is what was in Newton's papers. A lot of people just teach F equals MA first so that you don't have to define momentum first. I'm bringing up impulse now so that we can utilize the definition, utilize the concept when looking at the canon over here because each of the two objects here, both the ball and the cannon itself, undergo an impulse in this interaction. And what we're going to prove as a general rule is that the two objects involved in a collision and or an explosion will have equal and opposite impulses. That's one of the things we're about to prove. Any questions about these concepts before we now start applying all this to actually look at how the math plays out for firing a cannonball? Okay. So, we have our ye olde pirate cannon. We are going to fire a cannonball out of it. If you've ever watched a movie with one of these cannons in it, you probably noticed that once the cannon goes off, cannonball ejects out, well, ejects out at high speed, and the cannon knocks back a little bit, possibly a lot of it. That is the recoil, and that happens because in the explosion, it's not only going to exert force forward on the cannonball, the blast in here is going to exert force back on the cannon itself. And in order for the total momentum on this side to still add up to zero, however much forward momentum the ball gains, the cannon has to gain the same amount of momentum backward so that their finals still total zero like the initials do. And so that's, that's in general where recoil comes from, any form of recoil, even just hurting your arm by throwing a baseball too hard. Ball exerts a force back on you, so you know keep that in mind. In this specific case, we have a 15 kilogram cannonball that we're going to launch from rest up to a launch speed of 81 meters per second. The actual cannon is a 275 kilogram molded lump of cast iron. Those things are heavy. It also starts at rest. And eventually we're gonna figure out the speed at which it is recoiled. You wanna know how fast it's knocked back. So that you can, if you are building the ship that this is taking place on, so that you can account for it in the ship design and make sure that there is basically a track long and strong enough to, uh, for the, basically that you, I'm under the impression most ships had rails that the cannon could slide around so that it would knock back onto the rails and not slide across the entire boat or take out someone standing behind it. It would be caught in the rails and some mechanism inside would roll it back forwards. So to build such a thing, you'd have to know the recoil speed and we're also gonna figure out the force of the blast to make sure that the cannon itself doesn't just blow up. Make sure that the cast iron can handle that yield of force. Any questions with the physical setup before we start investigating? All right. First, and we've acknowledged this point before, but first question, what is the total momentum in the system before launch? Zero. Nothing's moving yet. 
And that's gonna be true in most explosion type collisions. Things tend to start at rest and then burst outwards from there. So to illustrate a point, I'm gonna go ahead and indicate total momentum initial, we know it will be zero. Likewise, total final momentum should also be zero, according to this law. Which means that the two objects that add together into total final momentum, the momentum of each single object need to be equal and opposite. And since they are vectors, one of them can be negative and backwards to cause them to add up to zero. Now instead of zero, I'm gonna actually replace this with momentum cannon final and momentum ball final, just to, dem to use that as a springboard for a few more points. Instead of writing cannon and cannon ball, I'm just writing cannon and ball. These are the two final momenta that need to add up to zero so that the total on both sides is zero, which again should demonstrate if two things add up to zero, they should be equal and opposite. But those aren't the only things that are going to be equal and opposite, because now I, need, I'm, I want us to think about the impulse of each object. First question, with the information we have, can we determine the impulse of the cannonball? Yes. How, how should we go about doing that? Uh, the mass of it times the speed of it. Very good. Mass times the change in velocity. Because we know it starts at rest and then accelerates up to 81. So we can figure out how much momentum it needs to gain to make that happen. And that will be its impulse. The impulse it absorbs from the blast. A mass of 15 kilograms, the change in velocity of the ball, it ends at 81 and started at zero. So final minus initial, 81 minus zero. And that means the cannonball's impulse, correct me if I'm wrong, should be 1,215 kilogram meters per second of momentum forward. Since impulse is change in momentum, it has the same unit as momentum. And additionally, momentum, I'm sorry, impulse is still a vector. It points in the direction that the momentum changes in. So since the momentum went from zero to forward, impulse points forward. Bless you. So that's the impulse of the cannonball. Questions determining that number. All right. Now, next thing, what is the impulse of the cannon itself in this interaction? I'm gonna prove how, I'm gonna get to that mathematically. I'm gonna show the algebra for it. But before I do that, just assumptions. What should the impulse of the cannon be in this interaction? Does the cannon absorb momentum in the blast? It's gonna absorb some. What direction does that point? The opposite direction of the firing. Right, because the cannon ball is gonna absorb forward momentum, so its impulse points forward. The cannon, it's gonna have an impulse, and it's gonna point backwards. The question is, what will, what, what's the number for that impulse? And what we're about to prove I'm going to show you, so I'm going to, turn my, I, the fact that I keep stumbling over my words means it's time for a water break. Stay hydrated, especially if you talk for a living. What we're going to prove now is that the cannon's impulse should be 1215 backwards. And this is because, as a rule, two objects involved in a collision, including an explosion, will have equal and opposite impulses. Because 
the momentum that one of them absorbs, the other had to lose. And because they exert the same force on each other for the same amount of time, just pointing in opposite directions. So that's the assumption, that's the rule that we are now going to, I am, I am now going to demonstrate mathematically. So now, instead of just cutting straight to total momentum initial equals zero, I'm actually gonna write out the two initial momenta over here instead of just skipping straight to the zero. So momentum initial cannon plus momentum initial ball. Those are the two initial momenta that add up to the total initial, like how the two finals add up to the total final on the other side. On Friday, we kept all the initials to one side and all the finals to the other. Today, I'm going to do something slightly different so that I can try to make this more about impulse. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, instead of separating based on final and initial, I'm going to separate based on each object. I'm going to bring momentum final cannon over here and send momentum initial ball over there. So that instead of initial, initial, final, final, it's cannon, cannon, ball, ball. So subtracting momentum final cannon over to the left, momentum initial cannon minus momentum final cannon. And then send momentum initial ball over to the right. So momentum final ball minus momentum initial ball. So again, just separating based on object rather than state. And this is actually going to turn it into an impulse question. Because I'm going to focus more on the right to start with. On the right, the way that I wrote it, I kept momentum final ball and then subtracted momentum initial ball from it when I brought it over. So now it's momentum final minus momentum initial. So the entire right side is now the change in momentum of the cannonball. And change in momentum is impulse. So the right side has now become the impulse of the cannonball. Mass of the cannonball times its final speed minus mass of the cannonball times its initial speed. 15 times 81 minus zero is all 15. So the entire right side is now just the impulse of the cannonball. Which logically means the left side should be the impulse of the cannon. And we do have the final and the initial set against each other. It's just the signs are a little bit backwards right now. We've got initial minus final, which is the opposite of how it normally works. So what I'm gonna do next to turn this into the normal final minus initial that I would expect, is I'm going to distribute out a negative one to invert the signs. So negative one, so negative one times open parentheses, momentum in, negative momentum initial cannon plus momentum final cannon. Even though it's backwards, it's still technically final minus initial. So now it's negative one times impulse cannon. Is that unclear? Does that make sense? So this, technically final minus initial, I'm now gonna rewrite, just replace everything in the parentheses with impulse cannon. Negative one times impulse cannon equals 1215, the impulse of the cannonball. The negative one is there to prove same number, but opposite direction. So if we bring the negative one over, impulse cannon should be negative 1215 negative indicating its impulse, its gained momentum points backwards. 
any two objects involved in a two object collision should have equal and opposite impulses because they exert equal and opposite forces on each other the same amount of time. But the same impulse can cause different objects of different mass to change their velocities by different amounts. The cannonball sped up a lot from absorbing 12, 15 units of momentum. The cannon is a lot more massive, so it's not going to speed up as much, but it will gain speed just backwards. And that's how all recoil works. Questions about, again, this main rule right here for now. Two objects involved in a collision, equal and opposite impulses, because they're doing the same but opposite thing to each other. All right. Now that we know the impulse of both objects, two things we can do with that is one, figure out the force involved in the explosion, because if you were building this cannon, you'd want to make sure it could handle that amount of firepower. You don't want the physical cannon just shattering, which would send iron shrapnel all over the inside of your boat. And then we can also figure out, again, the recoil speed. Because if we know the cannon's change in momentum, we can figure out how much its speed changed as a result. So, we've already defined impulse as change in momentum. Now we're gonna use the other two parts as well. Impulse equals force times time. The blast causes both objects to have an impulse of 1215 that is caused by some amount of force in the explosion, which acts for 0 0.05 seconds. Therefore, the force involved in the blast, hope I'm remembering this right, about 24,000 newtons, which is a lot of gunpowder. This cannon has even a single hole or weak seam on it. It's not going off twice. This thing physically has to handle that much force within it every single time it goes off. There were several cases of cannons just blowing up and that could possibly sink your boat. Questions on this part? This thing hap this basic interaction happens for every collision, every explosion. The force from one object on the other acts over time to cause the impulse. This is the force that causes the acceleration, that causes the velocity change. It's also the force that does the work to transfer and transform energy in the collision as well. So the very last point, the final thing that we're finally going to figure out is what the cannon's recoil speed would be. The cannon's impulse is negative 1215. Its mass is 275 kilograms. We can finally now figure out its final speed, assuming it was at rest to start with. Negative for backwards, four point, correct me if I'm wrong, 418 meters per second, again, backwards. Which might not sound like a lot, but note again that one meter per second is about 3.3 3 feet per second. So in one second, this cannon could be about 15 feet behind where it was a second ago which, you know, if you're standing in the way of there, you don't have shins anymore. So this cannon's probably a bit over two. It's using too much gunpowder, and it needs to be very well secured. How do you guys feel? 
notion that all explosions are just weird collisions making sense? Now, a um, couple things I want to talk about before we break today. One, bring these notes to lab. Two, I want to highlight which questions on the upcoming homework count as explosions like this. Because you can have an explosion even if there isn't a literal bomb going off. Uh, there's two of the homework stroke quiz questions that come to mind. I just like to point this out because I usually get a few questions about it. I'm just trying to cut them off ahead of time. There's one homework and or quiz question where someone is standing on ice stationary and they throw something away from themselves. Technically an explosion because everything starts at rest and then blasts back away from each other. Because if you're on perfectly slick ice and you chuck something, you get recoiled backwards. Ice just means that there's less friction to allow the motion to be more noticeable. So one homework question that is an explosion type collision is this one. And similar to this one, there's one that just takes place in space, removing the ground and the friction entirely. You might have seen in some sci-fi that if someone's drifting in space, they can chuck something in one direction and they get recoiled in the opposite. Same basic thing. So those are the explosion type questions on the homework. Again, they don't have to involve a literal bomb going off. Anything where you start at rest and burst out from it, technically an explosion. Uh, the other thing I want to bring up is again, lab this week. We're back on a normal lab schedule. Lab this week will involve these principles because we're going to be using the air tracks to cause collisions between two carts going to be analyzing the momentum both before and after, therefore talking about the impulse before and after, whatever the two colliding carts are in terms of their masses, one's impulse on the other should equal the other's impulse back on it, however much momentum one gains, the other had to lose. But lab is also going to further involve tying kinetic energy back into this because they are related principles. They're distinct, but they're related. Since both formulas have M and B in them, if you have one, you have the other. So since all collisions involve momentum transfer, they also involve kinetic energy transfer. But the precise behavior of the kinetic energy depends on the type of collision you're having. So that's gonna be the main thing explored during lab this week, just to kind of set it up for you guys. You're gonna be causing different types of collisions and seeing what happens as a result. The two main types being elastic, where things bounce off from each other, and inelastic, where they don't. The arrow hitting the log on Friday was a textbook inelastic collision, because it just sunk in, didn't bounce away, and now they are both one object rolling forwards. Elastic collisions, things bounce off from each other. So. Lab will explore the two different types and lumping kinetic energy in along with everything we've just been talking about. So it's multifaceted, but it's framed as exploring the concept. And then later on this week, we'll be doing more involved math for how kinetic energy factors into all this. How you guys feel? Nice. Glad to hear it. Let me know if at any point any of these concepts don't feel nice. I want to make sure that you understand them. Um, that's everything I want to talk about today. So bring these notes to lab whenever you have it. Let me know if you need anything. And have a great day.